As far as Spencer's childhood, he was extremely competitive in everything he did. It's 12 to nothing. I love it. Here we go. That's it. That's it. Oh, oh! Oh! Hands up, Hands up, Spencer Wilson as a child was ultra competitive. Um, first thing that comes to mind. Literally anything I could do to remain active, I was I was trying to do it. First word that comes to my mind when I think of Spencer Wilson is competitor and fighter. And I think that was one of his uh, most valuable traits as a player in our program is just the competitive spirit that he brought to the team and that just how it radiated out into everybody else. And he was the heartbeat of who we were and uh, he's just been competing his whole life. And that, that word competitor or fighter really stands out to me when I think about Spencer. Spencer is the most competitive person I've ever met, uh, really and truly. He, he won't even let you lose a coin flip. You know, he, he's always ready to, to, to go at it. And so we've had our battles together, especially through basketball, and now he and I run together. Uh, and that's more of a, a one-way competition where I'm trying to keep up with him. He's hard-headed, but he's also passionate. He has a passion that makes him do crazy things, like run a marathon when he's told that he shouldn't run. Yeah, stubborn hard-headed and passionate. He was dedicated to his craft of playing by one to get better. Uh, and he was dedicated to being a friend. And I've seen more of that after coaching. Um, he's always, always interested in, in how others are doing um, before himself. And he's dedicated to you, the person. He's dedicated to whatever he's choosing. And, um, and man, he stayed loyal. No doubt about it. He competed with himself when he got out on the field. Um, he did not like second place. He would take his second place trophies and he would take a hammer and beat them and throw them in the trash can because he never wanted second place. The competitive nature is not this relentless desire to win as it is this relentless desire to not lose. I hate losing. I think now it's it's more so a competition within. Like when I go running, it's, and I'm pu really pushing it on a hard day, it's me trying to beat my previous time. It's like, how can I push the pace? Hurry, bro, empty, empty. Ah! Bro, you came out so hot. Ah! really love the challenge of someone telling me you can't do something. 
I feed off of that. That's kind of where I get my fuel a lot of times is when people tell me I can't do it. Cause then I'm just like, I, I've, I've got to now. The summer of 2009, Spencer was playing at a um, tournament in Memphis and we had noticed a little lump in the side of his leg, um, beside his knee that summer. And it, I remember in that tournament seeing it and it looked bigger to me. We're in Memphis for the National Basketball Tournament and we're gonna win. weeks later we took him in to uh, Baptist to have just a little biopsy done sent it off to pathology and we went back on August the 20th 2009 and um, sorry. I remember sitting in the room and the doctor kind of put the put the x-rays and the MRIs and everything on the on the screen and he just showed the spot and he said it's cancer and I I legit just blacked out from then on for the next like 10 minutes like I I don't even remember what he said past that I felt super hot like everything in my body went hot and I was just like whoa It's one of those moments that you don't think you'll ever experience with your children. And even when we went to that doctor's appointment, still thinking, okay, there's, they're just gonna tell us we're gonna do a little surgery, we'll take out the tumor, everything will be good. And when we got there, um, the report wasn't quite like that. The first thought running through my mind was, am I gonna be able to play basketball? I just looked at him and I'm like, am I, like, am I gonna be able to play? And he said, no, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to take a, a break. <laughs> That's when it hit me and I just started crying right there. My parents didn't say anything. They didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to say. And we w walked to the car and we sat down and my mom and dad were in the front. I was in the back and my dad after a couple minutes, just looked in the rearview mirror and said, we're gonna get through this. We're going to get through this. You're gonna beat this. You're gonna have so many people praying and supporting you. You're gonna be fine. And that really set the tone for the next eight months. The type of cancer that he had was called rhabdomyosarcoma. It's a big long word, but it basically is a form of muscle cancer. And in fact, that's where the cancer was. It was located in his thigh muscle, on the, on the, again, on the lateral aspect of the left thigh. The cancer seemed to be localized just to his leg. And that's a very good sign in cancer. You obviously don't want it to have spread because anytime cancer spread, that just signifies a more aggressive cancer and typically harder to treat. So we were pretty happy. We called Spencer non-metastatic, which means hadn't spread yet. In our initial meetings, they were super optimistic. I mean, they're like, we're gonna do chemo for eight months. Chemo is gonna do its job. We're gonna remove the tumor, um, get clear margins, and in eight months you're gonna be back playing basketball. There was never a moment where I didn't have hope. It, it was like this insane assurance. Looking back, I feel like it was the Lord as well that gave this assurance to me. So we started him on uh, pretty aggressive, despite it being non-metastatic, we know this is an aggressive cancer and we treat it aggressively. So we started him on chemotherapy with plans to operate uh, once we shrunk it down and then 
plus or minus radiation therapy. That was to be determined. The chemotherapy regimen um, back then was, and still is, pretty intense. It's about nine to 10 months of chemotherapy. It starts off every week, and then, then after about 10 weeks, it goes to every three weeks. Spend some of that time in the hospital, some of the time in the clinic. We gave him about three months of chemotherapy. It looked like he had a really good response. It had shrunk down very nicely. And the surgeon said, well, let's go in and get what's left of it out. So he did, and to our um, pleasant surprise, it was all dead. It, the, the tumor itself had shrunk down to very, very small size, and what we took out was dead, which meant chemotherapy was working. When you want to talk about his, his competitive level, they had told us the date. They said March 15th is the day you should finish all of your treatments. But they said you will not finish your treatments on the 15th. That's just protocol. That's what, if you hit everything on schedule, that's what the date would be. Your cell counts had to be at a certain point in order to get the treatments. And it was almost like he would will his body. He was so competitive. He was like, no, they're not going to stop this treatment. I'm going to keep on going. I'm finishing on March 15th. I think it was something God instilled within me from birth. And I've come to realize it's a blessing in the hands of the Lord, but a curse in the hands of my human nature. <laughs> um, because I've, I've seen how it's pushed people away at times. Um, but I've also seen how if I didn't have that competitive drive, I wouldn't be alive, ultimately. I, I remember my last chemo treatment, walking out of that hospital like I am free. No more chemo treatments, no more doctor visits. I'm like, I'm done with this stuff. So at the three month mark, would go in, they would do CT scans, MRIs, x-rays just to make sure it hadn't returned. Um, and then they did it at the six month mark. The period in between was great because I was finally able to eat and not throw up. I started growing my hair back, which, which I loved obviously, and started regaining some strength. So being able to get some energy back was unbelievably encouraging. So we went to a six month scan, not expecting anything at all. We still felt like everything was great. And he was playing basketball, he was getting in shape, gaining weight, his hair had come back. Everything was starting to feel normal again. They called a few days after and said they saw a spot in the lymph nodes in my groin. And so they, my dad was the one who told me, and he's like, hey, do you feel anything down there? And I just remembered being in my room and I, like touch that area and I felt it in my heart dropped. Like I had this deep inexplicable inner feeling that it was back. So they did a needle biopsy. They sent it off to a couple different places, St. Jude's, MD Anderson's and Baptist all kind of reviewed it and looked at it. So the day that we got the prognosis, Spencer and I were heading to Davidson College to hang out with the Davidson basketball team and he was gonna talk to Steph Curry. Steph Curry had agreed to spend some time with him. And Jody had called me on the way there to let me know that he had definitely relapsed. The prognosis was very, very bad. My dad um, came into my room and he, he just said, Spence, we need, need to talk to you. Um, and I, I remembered I was working on a math problem <laughs> and I finished my math problem and I knew, I knew that I knew that I knew that it had come back. I, I knew by the tone of his voice, um, I knew by the way he looked at me, I sensed the, the fear and the pain just in the way he said, come downstairs, I need to talk to you. And so I get down there and he just, he's crying and he says, son, the cancer's returned. It's incurable and they've given you a 7% chance to live past six months to a year if you do the treatments. And that's when it, 
when it really hit. Um, I don't think about it very often. Um, my dad just laid there with me and kind of held me there in his arms. And I just, that's when I asked him, I said, Dad, am I, am I gonna die? And he said, I don't know. Anytime cancer comes back, that's a bad thing, obviously. Again, it, it signifies that the cancer is aggressive, probably resistant to the chemotherapy that we've already given it and is associated with a much worse prognosis. If he thought the first treatment regimen was intense, uh, the second one was even more intense. It is hard to approach relapse therapy with the same strength and positivity as the first go-round. We all hoped and believed that he was cured um, after the first time, and so it was devastating when he relapsed. His initial reaction was, I'm not doing it again. And that was devastating to hear as a parent that he was not going to try any treatments anymore because he had already you know, fought fiercely the first go around, and he was stunned, and um, he took a trophy and broke it and threw it across the room. I understood the anger, I really did, and God understood it even more than all of us. And I think this is where he had to really dig deep and that's where his initial reaction of, I'm not doing it again, came out. After a couple days, I finally came to my senses and I was like, no, I'm, I'm absolutely gonna fight. I'm absolutely gonna, gonna do this. I, I knew when I said yes, I knew what I signed up for. I was like, I'm signing up to throw up all the time. I'm signing up to lose my hair. I'm signing up to feel nausea. I'm signing up to give myself shots. Like I was fully aware of what I was getting ready to enter into. And just the thought of that was, just brought about a flurry of frustration and anger. Knowing you have a 7% chance to live, that pissed me off in itself. I was like, how do you put a percentage on someone's life? When you hear numbers like that, and you, we could see on the doctor's faces, it was just a, they approached us differently and started talking about, after the six months, we'll talk about palliative care. And I mean, it, it just was a whole different atmosphere than the first time. The first time was a lot of hope. The second time was, we'll keep him comfortable. It was more preparation for what to expect. Right. You know, how, how things would finish out. And that was what was devastating and really so hard to process. One night when I was at my grandparents and was just pleading with God to take me because of the amount of pain I was in um, and the amount of suffering I was going through, that was the only time where I was like, I wasn't just comfortable with it, I was wishing it. I was desiring death, welcoming it. Please, I can't go any longer. And that was like the ultimate breaking point. The radiation went from here down past his, his knee, so it hit the whole groin area. He'd gone through, or actually didn't even start puberty because he started chemo right when he was getting ready to hit puberty. And um, so when we went in to speak to the radiation oncologist, he said that this will um, most likely prevent you from having children because the radiation field is in this area. And to be sitting there with him while he's having to process things that, that you shouldn't hear at 14 years old, 
you shouldn't be hearing a doctor tell you you're probably not ever gonna have children. There were things that just were told to him that I, I thought, how do you process that at 14? Because at my age, I couldn't process those things. I didn't know how to process pain. I didn't know how to process suffering. I built this wall around myself to protect myself, but it, that same wall I built to protect myself is what isolated me and pushed people away. People couldn't get to me. The second go round was tough. And in the middle of all the cr pain and craziness and grasping for some kind of understanding, I was, I was diagnosed of having prostate cancer. One morning, the phone rang and it was Jody and said, Daddy, would you mind telling Spencer what's happened to you? Because they didn't want him to know. He didn't need any more trauma. But at that moment, I think Billy was holding him in the backseat on the way to Brenner's for the treatment because Spencer had given up and he would rather jump out of the car and just go home and just die than to have to keep going through this crazy treatment. So I said, do you really want me to talk to him? He said, yeah, just tell him what's happened to you. Hello, Spencer. Never forget it. Yeah, Papa. I just want you to know you're, you're not alone. What do you mean, Papa? Well, I've, I've been diagnosed with cancer too. So I just thought, well, Spencer, I'm, I'm in there with you. And I'll never forget his reaction. He said, Papa, what have we both done to make God so angry with us that he put cancer on us? And everything inside of me says, don't try to answer that question. He's only a little boy. I said, Spencer, I, I can't even touch that question. All I know is, and it was absolutely spontaneous. I said, Spencer, all I know is, I have a prayer, my prayer is that one day I will marry you, not bury you. I really developed this flawed view of God that he was you know, striking me with cancer and giving me this sickness in order to teach me lessons. So that's what really led to a lot of the bitterness that I carried was when my internal world with God was wrong, it affected everything. What really kept me going was being able to play basketball. He would come out of a, um, a treatment where he would be there for five days in a bed where you don't get to move, you're tethered to a, an IV pole for, okay. for five straight days. He would get out of the appointment and he would push the doctors, come on, let me, let me out, let me out. So he would get to go to his Y uh, basketball game. So like we would get in the car and drive straight to the game. And he had zero energy, but he was like, no, I'm gonna play. It was like this place of solace and this place of escape that I could really go to where I, I didn't think about anything else. It was just me doing what I was passionate about, which was basketball. Even to this day, when, I, when I'm shooting by myself, I can kind of check out. And that's what running has become for me. It's become a place where I clear my mind. It's just me the majority of the time and don't have to think about anything else. Did you find victory after the last remission? Was there a elation? Was there like jubilee, like internally or? It was more of like, finally this is done, but it wasn't like this elation. I, I don't even know how to describe it. 
It wasn't that I thought it would come back because the first time I didn't think it would come back, but it was more, I guess, the fact that I had it twice kind of put things into perspective. It's like, don't get too hyped because, I mean, you never know. Featuring the biggest names and the best stories in sports, the following is a presentation of E60 Sports Matter. Good evening, everybody, and welcome for tonight's showdown between your Bishop McGinnis villains and the Bears of Mount Area High School. Miracles have no schedule, no favorites, no home court. A little floater in the paint, banked it in. On this night, on this court, a miracle and a moment met. Launch the three for the tight. Run, Will, run, Will, look, Vince. The next basketball season, Spencer was a junior and the starting point guard at Bishop McGinnis High School. There it is, right there. Yeah, good, good, Spence. Spencer and Nick, can you score? If you His can, coach, looking for extra motivation for a game against their bitter rivals, Mount Airy, presented his team with an idea. The dedication game is a game where I wanted our guys to think outside of themselves and play for something other than themselves and each other. We passed the basketball around the locker room. Each person signed their name on the ball and wrote the name of the person they were dedicating the game to on the ball. Together on three. One, two, three, together. Good evening, everybody, and welcome for tonight's showdown between your Bishop Biggins villains and the Bears of Mount Airy High School. Back the other way, Spencer Wilson with the drive right down the lane, splits a double team, lay it in with the foul. Spencer Wilson. The game was tight throughout, with Spencer the team's most consistent score. Great job by Wilson. Still, with just under 10 seconds remaining, Bishop was down by three. Eford into the corner to Wilson behind the screen, launches the three for the tie. Good! Spencer Wilson with four seconds left. Bears get it in bounds. Gallimore to the midline. Go launch the three for the win, and it's short. And we're going overtime. With just 2.2 seconds to go in overtime, a Bishop foul gave Mount Airy two free throws to win the game. Spencer was over talking to me and said, what do you want me to do? So I say to Spencer, just try to get it and get the best shot off that you can. See what they want to do with this shot here for Horton. Will he miss it intentionally? Probably too much time left for that, but we will miss it. Rebound comes down to Gardner, leads it ahead to Wilson, gonna lob it up from three-quarter court. It's got a shot, it's good! Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness, Spencer With the shot and that whole game, I mean, that was, that was a defining moment in my life. I mean, it was, it's a top five moment I will ever have, bar none. And seeing how people kind of gravitated to that story and, you know, having, all the attention surrounding that. It was so amazing and I, I didn't really know what the what the fruit of it would be at the time. I think further along down the road, he understood the impact that he was able to make. It had a big impact on me um, as the coach for sure, but I think as a person, it had a, uh, a bigger impact because Billy told me that he had a vision when Spencer was younger that Spencer would have a platform to share his story. And just the impact of that and knowing that, you know, we had a small part in it was, had a major impact on me. I think they have some clippings from this shot in one of these. Boom. You said, what do you want me to do? I remember saying, just get it and get the best shot you can. Yeah. Like, do we wanted you to shoot it. But then I remember seeing that ball float and hit the backboard and go in. 
you know, most people, you know, it's just jumped up. I just remember thinking, like, like you, like, did that just really yeah. happen? Like, and just the calm, right? like, yeah. it was such a surreal, like, you can't even really put into words the feeling, like, that it was. I literally have goosebumps right now. You know, you can't really <laughs> put yeah. into words what the feeling was. When I was 10, I told my dad, I want to play college basketball. He's like, okay, you do what it takes, and you put the work in, and eventually you'll be able to do that. So that was kind of like my mission from 10 until my senior year of high school. Spencer at that point had already committed to Belmont Abbey. Um, he was going to be the, the top guard of, of the class, and so he was hitting me up every single day, wanting to get together and meet up. And so we eventually drove to Belmont Abbey together and saw a game. Uh, and on the way, we hit it off, and I'd always knew who he was just from what he had been through. We grew up in the same town. Um, he was talk of the town, you know, for a while uh, in our early teen years. You know, he was my guy, and it was an easy decision to, to go to Belmont Abbey after that. I'm training really hard. I'm going, you know, three hours a day, just trying to get stronger, put on weight. And one day I'm in the gym lifting, and that's when my left leg just swelled up. He was tripping on the basketball court, trying to run, trying to do everything he could do to, to continue playing at his level, but he could not. And it just felt like this fluid in my leg, and I, I didn't know what it was. So went into the doctor, um, and he took a look at it, asked about my medical history. I was like, how much time do you have? <laughs> Told him about getting my lymph nodes removed. And because those were removed, there was no way for fluid to kind of filter up and down that leg. And for whatever reason, it sparked up five years after I finished, seven years after I finished chemo, radiation and everything. Um, and he just said, you, you have lymphedema is what it's called. And you should not play basketball this year. And I was, I was like, dude, you don't understand how much work I put in. I've played through chemo, I've played through radiation, I'm playing through this. And so finally it got to a point in the season where I was like, I, I just cannot continue. Like I cannot keep on playing. Went to the doctor and he said, Spencer, you've, you've got scar tissue in your leg that's formed from the excessive pounding and from just putting so much strain on your leg. If you keep playing, there's gonna be serious long-term health effects. And I was like, okay, I do not want my leg amputated. I do not want to not be able to walk. And I had to make the decision to stop playing. And that was a very, very, very hard and dark time. Because like I said, I was, I was addicted to basketball. I mean, it was essentially my, my idol. It was my God. I, I worshipped it. I knew Spencer, something was going on with him, um, just from when I had met him to maybe two or three months into Belmont Abbey. I knew um, he's always been just a fantastic person, a great human being, but I really noticed that he was far from God, um, just from what was going on with his leg, and you know, it felt very unfair, and it was unfair. Uh, and so I, I knew something was going on, um, and just seeing him, him go through that, it was, it was tough on me, and I was just trying to do whatever I could to help. But it was weird, just because he was getting more playing time. He's always been the better basketball player, but I just happened to be healthy. And, and it, it, just felt, it just felt wrong. It felt you know, really bad. His whole life, he had worked toward this scholarship. This was, this was his dream, and he was living the dream that he wanted, which was to play college basketball. And when that happened, I think he went through a lot of depression. And I think the source of that depression would be twofold. One, I think his whole life, his identity was, I'm a basketball player, I'm a competitor, I'm gonna go out there, I'm gonna drain a three right in your face. That's, that was his goal, that was, that was his identity, that's who he was. So all of a sudden, his identity, it's like, who am I? It wasn't that I was like reshaping my identity, I didn't have one. It was gone. I felt it was taken from me by God. I was like, 
God stripped basketball away from me. Here he goes trying to teach me another lesson. And, and if I wasn't playing basketball, I wasn't gonna stay there. I wanted to go, I was either gonna go to college just to go to college, or I had the option to do this discipleship training school. But I went down to my grandparents' house and I chatted with them and just told them, I was like, hey, I, I have this sense that I need to do this discipleship training school. He told me about his thoughts and it was just exactly what I've been praying for almost two weeks. Spencer, it's time to kind of wrap up this season of your life and let's go to a new place. But the worst thing when you get something like that is to try to give it somebody and it not be his decision. But it was his decision and I, I couldn't help but just smile because I already sensed this is what, what the Lord wanted to do. And, and I think during that time was when the Lord really worked some things in his heart. Um, and I remember the Lord giving me the scripture in Ezekiel 36, 26, that I will take from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And we were on the phone with him one day and I said, Spence, I really feel like this is the scripture that the Lord has given me for you. And when I said that, he just kind of chuckled. He was like, someone else just gave me that scripture, that same scripture. And I know that's what the Lord was doing during that time is he was taking that, that hard, stony heart from him, that anger, that um, rejection he felt. That's what he was saying is, you are my beloved. I take great delight in you. I love you. I, I kind of made this deal with the Lord. I said, here's what's up. You're either going to encounter me and show me that you're real and show me that you love me and you care about me and you're not just trying to destroy my life or you're not gonna show up at all and my theory of you not even existing is gonna be true um, and I'll never, you know, never believe in you because you don't exist. When I arrived, like the first week, we had a worship night. My cousin puts his hands on my shoulders and he starts praying. And as he starts praying, I have this open vision of a hand holding my heart. And I knew it was God holding my heart. And it was completely covered in stone. And I just saw this hand chiseling away at it. And all the stone was breaking off and beneath it was this beautiful red beating heart. And that was the moment where I was like, you're real. <laughs> like you are undoubtedly real, you love me. And in that moment, I just felt him pouring his spirit into my heart. From then on out, I was, I said, Lord, I am, I am yours forever. In a moment, depression was gone absolutely eradicated. In a moment, I felt this sense of purpose and identity over my life. Like I knew I was God's. It, it was the, the most inexplicable, wild encounter I've ever had. And it reset the trajectory of my entire life. I think there's been like two or three out of body experiences I've had, my wedding and the time I first encountered Jesus. What do you think your wife will look like? Just kidding. Think she'll be pretty? Uh, gosh, stupid bug. <laughs> look up at me. I love you. Spencer and I have known each other for basically our whole lives. His dad and my dad played baseball together growing up. And since I can remember, he was a part of my life. Well, Spencer has a tendency to get hard on himself. If he has a goal he's trying to accomplish or a dream that he's trying to accomplish, yeah, if that doesn't come to pass in the way that he thinks that it should or the way that he planned, he can, he can beat himself up pretty good. So I definitely try to offer him new perspective. I try to be there for him in those hard moments, but also not let that get the best of him. And so I'm always you know, telling him, hey, there's always tomorrow. You did a good job or like, look where you've come. You were, you were here at one point and now look at where you're at. You've grown so much. And sometimes we just need a perspective change. And that's what I try to do for him. I remember this time when I was chatting with Elizabeth, I was in Ireland 
on outreach and was talking to her just about some of the frustrations I had of not being healed. And she just said, Spencer, have you ever thanked God for your leg? It's like, what do you mean have I ever thanked God for my leg? No, I, I hate that I have lymphedema. And she was like, you need to thank him for it. At first I was kind of angry. I was like, who are you to tell me this? Like, you don't have, you don't have a chronic illness. You don't know what it's like. Um, but as I, as I sat back and thought about it, that was really the turning point when I was able to shift my focus outward. Before then, I couldn't do it. And it was like she unlocked something that allowed me to see beyond myself. Our infertility journey hasn't been easy. You don't really think that that's something you're gonna have to deal with until the doctors tell you. Um, so I think for me personally, processing through it has been a roller coaster. One minute you're super faithful, the next minute you feel like, man, maybe I'll never get pregnant. But I think ultimately my faith has grown because of infertility. I mean, really there's no way we would have kids if it, if it isn't by the hand of God himself. So. Although it's been extremely hard, it's been disappointing, it's been heartbreaking. At the end of the day, I can always say I'm, yeah, faithful. And sometimes the faith feels really weak. Even if I don't have the faith for something that seems impossible, the Lord does. And he gets to carry my faith and he gets to strengthen it and he gets to build, build it. And so the process, um, I think overall has been a, a positive journey. I've really learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about who I am, who Spencer is and I've come out stronger. I've definitely come out stronger in my, in my walk with the Lord and um, just in, in my walk as someone who has never suffered before. Um, yeah, I feel like I know what it is to suffer well now. June 1st, 2020. I was on the back porch, just meditating in silence. I just felt this overwhelming question, why am I alive? I, I had this impression that the Lord said the word victory. One word, victory. I saw myself running a marathon and I saw Levi filming and documenting the entire thing. And it was weird because I hated running. Like it wasn't on my radar. I hadn't run in four years and it wasn't something I, I was even thinking about doing. When Spencer told me he was gonna run a marathon, I had two initial reactions. Number one, who is this dude? Because the Spencer that I knew hated running. It was written all over his face that he, that he, he didn't like it. Secondly, when he told me what he was going to do, I said to, I think, his parents and him directly, well, I know that if this is what you're saying you're going to do, there's no doubt you're going to do it. If there was anybody that was going to do it and go through and overcome what he had to, then it was going to be him. I knew the word victory and the discovery of that word for myself was the reason I was born. Like, that's how strongly I felt it.
way too hot. Six. night wasn't feeling too hot felt kind of wonky and woke up around three o'clock and had a terrible fever whole body was aching so I kind of had a feeling that it was either COVID or the flu so um, today I went and got tested did the rapid test and it came back positive so it's day seven of quarantine everyone in the house ended up getting it so we're all just kind of laying low, reading, watching movies, um, answering emails here and there. So ever since not being able to run, it's been pretty tough. I, I definitely miss it. I feel like I have this constant restless energy that I'm waiting to get out. I'll probably work back into it really slow, do some slow, short miles and... Um, eventually build back up into the into the place that I was in right before all this. Next week is 26.2. <laughs> yeah, two weeks after that is 26.2. I'm not joking. My heart beats really quick just thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even gonna lie. I am nervous. I'm I, I'm actually nervous. What's for this your thing. like biggest fear about it? It's not or just like a your. It's not fear. Like it. I don't even know how to explain it, dude. Like back with basketball, like before a big game, where you just feel yeah, it's anticipation, the intense butterflies. Yeah, because you know everyone's gonna be there. It's gonna be hype, big expectations. Yeah, it's good nervousness. It's nervous excitement. These are more so mental miles than speed. Just need to get 19 under my belt mentally. Because I know my body's in three hour and 20 minute marathon shape, 738 pace. So it's basically the goal of this, just to know what it feels like more than anything. <laughs> Yeah? I'm literally about to diarrhea. Really? Oh, dude. 
Five more steps and I'm toast. Oh my gosh. Oh, it hurts. Napkins? Oh. I'll go look, see if I can find anything for you. Oh my gosh. Ah. Oh. oh. Be in here. All right, I'll be right back. Oh gosh. <laughs> may or may not have just given birth to a small child. That was a seven wiper. It was like a dam burst and <laughs> that was impressive. Like I actually am impressed. I've never had to do that on a long run before. It's painful. It's like seriously painful. Seven more miles to go. You still hitting another seven? Absolutely. I'm just hoping that lady doesn't go in the Porta John. Yeah. Adios. Yeah. Seven more. All right. See you later. Finished on a seven seventeen. <sighs> seven forty pace. Two seconds off of marathon time. Go. So. I feel fine, like breathing wise. It's just my legs, honestly. A lot of runs, I'll just get extreme tightness in my left calf to where every step, it feels like it's just getting restricted tighter and tighter and tighter. It's just been building up and adding more miles each week to where I'm gonna be able to handle the strain of a full 26.2 in, in one run. By mile four on this one, my left calf was just absolutely burning. And I had this crazy borderline psychotic thought of why don't I start with gratitude for my pain receptors, which sounds absolutely insane. So I was like, you know what, I'm gonna try and like reverse psychology myself. And so I just started thanking the Lord for my pain receptors. And before I knew it, like the pain literally left. Like I wasn't even thinking about that. It just like, I ushered myself into gratitude and it was so satisfying. And I kind of hit that euphoric, as they call a runner's high. Emmanuel is a lifelong friend of mine. He's seen every stage of life that we've detailed throughout this documentary. And he was actually there the day I was diagnosed with cancer. And he committed to shaving his head with me so that I wouldn't be the only one with a shaved head. So that kind of just speaks to his character and the nature of our relationship. And since then, he became my running coach when I started running and I told him about the marathon. He's an incredible athlete. So he helped me through this whole process. And yeah, that's, that's kind of how we know each other. Two weeks before the marathon, Emmanuel hit me up and said he wanted to run it with me. And so we got him a spot, got him registered, and he flew in two days before. And it's crazy, the week before he did a 70.3 half Ironman. And then the next week he came out to Wilmington and did the marathon with me. So it's pretty wild, just shows his, again, shows his character. And he paced me through the whole thing and encouraged me along the way, which was incredibly helpful. 24 hours out from the marathon, I was actually super nervous. I, that week I had only run eight miles and I was used to running like 35 to 40 miles every single week. So I didn't really know how my body would respond in the taper phase of my training. And so I was just anxious of whether I would come out super flat or what, you know, if I'd have nerves or anxiety on the day of the race. The whole process was an unknown, but I think something that really eased the anxiety um, that I was experiencing, I just prayed about it and I felt like the Lord said, Emmanuel will be with you. 
And I just sat back and like took it in and I realized he wasn't just speaking that metaphorically, like God will be with you, Jesus will be with you. He was saying it like Emmanuel, your good friend will be with you as well. And so it was like that double confirmation that the Lord would be with me and my best friend would be with me. So that was a really cool revelation that I had and, and eased a lot of the tension that I was experiencing. Less than 24 hours out, weather's perfect. Just did a little one mile run, feeling excellent. Let's get it. So the morning of the race, woke up at like 3 a.m. and I actually felt really good. I didn't have a whole lot of nerves or anxiety at all. I was just super stoked and ready to run this thing. I'd been training and preparing for the longest time and then it was finally the day. Emmanuel and I got up and we were just hanging out, got a nice pre-race dookie in, which was incredible. And I was super nervous that I wasn't going to be able to get it out and I was going to have a Carolina Beach round two. Definitely didn't want that to happen. He's a little nervous, I think. That two loop course is really mental. So we'll just get the first loop done. And then I'm probably just going to be talking to him the whole time. Like, just, just stay in it, stay in it, stay in it. You're good, you're good, you're good. So yeah, he's, he's trained, he's trained super well. I think he's ready. So he did a 19 miler. Um, one thing I'm worried about too is if he has to go to the bathroom or not. So you'll see that in the documentary if he has to. <laughs> oh my god. What is up, boys? It is time. It is game time. I want to yell and scream, but it's 5.02. Wake up the neighborhood. So I don't want to wake up the neighborhood. It's been literally an hour and 20 minutes. Hour and 20. We'll be on the line going. Feeling good, feeling excited, a little nervous, but stoked. Game time, baby. Let's go. Focused, dude. Focused, locked in, excited. It's about time. It's a cool atmosphere, seeing all the signage and runners out here. So, got a little run, stretching. Let's get it. Like that, man. Oh, we do. Several palsy. Come on, freaking getting it half marathon. My race strategy coming in was to do the first half marathon faster than the second half. And my intent behind that was I'd never run a full 26.2. So I wanted to make sure that I blocked out time on the front end. And I was just hoping that my adrenaline and willpower would kind of propel me through the fatigue that I knew was gonna come around mile 20. So that was the strategy going into it. Through the first half marathon, that's kind of how it went. Everything was super easy. I felt like I was floating and our average pace was like a 7-10 minute per mile pace.
the first point of true fatigue where the reality of a marathon set in was around mile 20. This is the peak counter. <laughs> Don't put this in the documentary. All of a sudden, the fatigue set in, the lactic acid set in, and it was miserable. The first 20, I ran with my head. In the last 6.2, I ran with my heart. I think the worst miles were the last three. The last 5K was brutal. I was almost blacking out. I could see the whites around my eyes and I was extremely hungry, extremely fatigued. Emmanuel kept saying, dude, are you good? And I think for the last six miles, I literally didn't respond to him. Like he would ask me questions and I just totally ignored him. I was in the pain cave, full suffer fest, just going for it and blocked every single thing out. There was never a point where I was like, oh, I can't finish this thing. I mean, it was, even though 19 miles was the furthest I'd ever run, there was never a point where I was like, yeah, I'm not gonna finish this. And I think that was the biggest revelation I had on the run was this is easy. Like, yes, it hurts. Yes, it's challenging, but my goodness, I've gone through chemo twice. I've gone through radiation, I've gone through depression. This is nothing compared to that. This absolutely pales in comparison to the things I've been through already. So that was a huge uh, mental hurdle that kind of pushed me through those challenging thoughts um, and physical pain that I was experiencing and got me to the finish line. Throughout the whole process, I've kind of learned that it's not about running. Victory is not about winning. It's a mindset, it's a mentality. Victory has ultimately become a part of my identity. In my journey so far, you've got cancer, lymphedema, infertility, depression, marriage, this marathon. And I look at all those and they're, they're chapters in this larger story. But when I think about victory, it's not just a chapter in the story. It's the title of the book that is my life.
It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. And I, I thought, you know, if he was instantly healed the first time without the suffering, without the pain, would it have really made the impact? You know, it was in the suffering of Christ that the great passion of God came through that suffering. And the thing that I think was so special is he became more than a grandson, he became a friend. And we began to develop a real friend relationship. And a friend is someone who you can tell the worst and share the worst about you without any fear at all that they're just not going to love you anymore. And we became desperately honest about a lot of stuff. And that was just the beginning. And that has continued that Spencer has really been a great friend. And I really believe this. I believe that my friend Spencer is beginning to discover God through Jesus. And that really means a lot to me. And I'll never forget uh, someone asking Jody, if you had to go through this again, would you change anything? And she didn't hesitate. She said, I would do it all over again for everything that the Lord has done in us and through us, through our family, through Spencer. And that was, that was an incredible moment. A physical miracle is amazing, but it doesn't last forever. A heart miracle that I received, if cultivated, lasts for an eternity. So to me, that's where I'm able to be grateful and say, I saw the greater miracle. You know, even though I'm not healed physically 100%, my heart has been completely healed. I've received a brand new identity. I know who I am and whose I am, and that will never change.